Susan B. Anthony was born in Adams, Massachusetts on February 15, 1820. Anthony grew up in a Quaker family. They were quite religious and were taught to show their love for God by working to help people. They believed one gender was equal to another, but this was not the case. In reality, women did not have the same rights as men. Their education was lower, and women weren't as respected as they are today. Her father, Daniel Anthony, was the owner of a cotton mill. Her mother, Lucy Reed, was a Baptist until her marriage. Susan wondered why her mother was a Quaker and not a Baptist like before. Her mother explains that all wives must follow their husband and do what they say because it was the law. The two wed in 1817. Susan was the second oldest of eight children. However, only five of her siblings lived to be adults. One child was stillborn and another died at age two. Being Quaker, Susan's family didn't believe in singing, dancing, fancy clothes, or drinking, but they did believe that all girls should get a proper education like boys. In 1826, six-year-old Susan and her family moved south to a large house in Badenville, New York. One day at Susan's school, the boys were learning long division and Susan asked if she could learn it too, but the teacher, who was male, said that girls didn't need to learn it. This made Susan very furious, so her father decided to build a home school. This is where Anthony received the bulk of her education. In 1838, Susan B. Anthony joined the Daughters of Temperance while working at the girls' department of Kenna Johari Academy. The Daughters of Temperance was a group of women who focused on the effects of alcohol and its negative impact on families. These women campaigned for stronger liberal laws. During the 1840s, Susan taught throughout various schools. She discovered how much more men were paid than women when working at the same job. Along with other teachers, Susan started to fight for equal wages. In 1845, the Anthonys moved to a farm in Rochester, New York. In 1849, Susan joined them and helped run the household while her father was away starting his insurance business. Susan kept on work for the temperance movement while beginning to become a more active participant in the abolitionist movement. Their farmhouse was a gathering place for fellow abolitionists like Frederick Douglass. Then in the 1850s, Susan began to get more and more involved in the women's suffrage movement. Susan B. Anthony's powerful conviction that men and women were equivalent led us to our voting rights today. In 1851, Susan participated in an anti-slavery meeting where she met Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Like Susan, Stanton had been campaigning for women's rights since 1848, and she was already a major role model in the suffrage movement. The two women became lifelong friends who pushed each other for change in the world. Stanton's motivation and confidence in Anthony helped her gain the courage to give her first speech at the National Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, 1852. At the Sons of Temperance State Convention in 1853, Susan B. Anthony was refused the right to speak. The men told her that since she was a woman, she was only invited to listen and learn. This made Susan furious, so she left the convention. That same year, herself and Stanton founded the Women's State Temperance Society. They petitioned the New York State Legislature in an attempt to pass a law limiting the amount of sale for liquor. They were able to get 28,000 signatures. However, their order was rejected because most of their signatures were from women and children. This was frustrating to Stanton and Anthony, so frustrating that it made them want to do better. Their new focus and drive now became violence. All throughout the 1850s and 60s, Anthony and Stanton dealt with speaking in public. Continuing their involvement in the temperance movement, both the two women still fought for equal wages, abolition of slavery, and suffrage. In 1856, Anthony became an official member of the Anti-Slavery Society. There she gave speeches, organized meetings, hung up posters, and sometimes had some dangerous encounters with others around her. She was brave when dealing with threatening mobs of people who could have seriously injured her, especially when at the same time her reputation was getting thrown through the streets. Stanton and Anthony kept work with the female suffrage and black suffrage, increasingly tying the two together. They formed the Women's National Loyal League in 1863, where they supported the 13th Amendment and continued campaigning for women and blacks' full citizenship. 
1868, Susan began publishing The Revolution, a weekly newspaper where she expressed how she felt, argued for women rights, and talked about suffrage. Anything even near relation to women's rights were brought up and spoken about in the newspaper. Many were angered by this, saying how because of how broad the topics were that it was only hurting the woman cause and that Stanton and Anthony should just quit. These negative reactions only drive Susan to do better. She persuaded a reasonable congressman to send out descriptions of her newspaper in order to get the word across. The revolution began to change women's perspective on themselves. They realized how much less they earned than men, which brought them closer together. Susan Elizabeth founded the National Women's Suffrage Association just a year after the revolution was published. This association split the suffrage movement into two parts. Anthony and Stanton mainly focused on the constitutional amendment all around America, while Lucy Stone founded the American Women's Suffrage Association, focusing mainly on the right to vote state by state. The 14th Amendment was adopted in the year 1868, addressing citizenship rights and equal protection of the law. This new law sparked Anthony's attention and argued that it gave women the constitutional right to vote in federal elections. So, she decided to vote in the next election in 1872. A couple days before election day, Anthony herself and 14 other women successfully registered to vote in Rochester, New York. After asking Anthony questions of citizenship under oath, her vote was put into the ballot. The election laws were that only white men and some black men were allowed to vote, leaving Anthony's action illegal. Most women living in different states were denied the right to vote when first registering. The woman explained that the 14th Amendment protected women's right and eligibility to vote. Nine days later, Anthony and the 14 other women were arrested by U.S. Commissioner William Storrs. Although each woman was under arrest, only Anthony's actions were signaled out and examined for any sign of a crime. Throughout the time of her indictment and trial, Anthony traveled throughout New York speaking to groups of people on whether or not it was a crime for citizens of the United States to vote. Susan B. Anthony's trial began in Canandaigua, New York on June 17, 1873. Since Anthony knew that only males could vote in New York and that she was violating the law, Judge Hunt went forth the jury and himself declared Anthony guilty as final. Anthony was charged with a fine of $100, however, she swore that she would never pay a dollar of unjust penalty. Then in 1887, Lucy Stone, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton founded the National American Woman Suffrage Association, ultimately fighting for both state and federal woman suffrage. In the long years of 1888 through 1889, Anthony and Ida Huston Harper was working very hard in order to publish her first book, The Life and Work of Susan B. Anthony, The Story of the Evolution of the Status of Woman. This book represented Susan's struggles accomplishments, and drive. She inspired many women throughout the world to never give up on themselves, and from that day forward, us women have never given up. In 1905, Anthony was the last main official representative of the Women's Suffrage Association left. Still continuing on their campaign, Susan went to see President Theodore Roosevelt in Washington, D.C. about submitting her amendment request to the Congress. Right before her death on March 13, 1906, Susan still traveled, preparing and speaking her speech, failure is impossible. Anthony was not able to live long enough to see women get the vote since the 19th Amendment was not declared until 1920. The amendment was simple but powerful, telling us that citizens of the United States were to not be denied their right to vote, no matter their gender. Susan and her legacy still lived on by making women's dreams a reality. Susan stood up for what she believed in and dedicated herself for the fight of equality of male and female. In the beginning, Anthony was a determined woman with a big dream, but in the end, she became a beloved national figure who even little girls today are able to look up to. Because of her fight, the United States government honored her by putting her image on a new coin, the Susan B. Anthony dollar. However, Susan Brownell Anthony's fight did not end woman's struggle, but perhaps it was just the beginning. Years and years to pass, Susan B. Anthony will be known as the woman who believed failure is impossible.